Hello, and welcome to the Bread of Life Church. I'm Pastor Mike Stratton, the senior pastor, and we welcome you tonight. The Bread of Life Church is a non-denominational church in Buffalo, New York, and tonight we have nightly manna. Our nightly Bible study, we have that from Monday through Saturday at 7 p.m., and it's taught by one of the leaders of our church. So, I know it's going to be a blessing for you. Let's go in and hear what the leader has to say. Good evening, and welcome to the Bread of Life Evening Bible Study. I'm Pastor Nancy here at the Bread of Life Church, and I've been doing a series on uh, the power of the blood. And the reason why I pretty much uh, say the same things when I start each session is because every session is kind of self-contained in itself but it's the same subject so I want to make sure that you have an idea of where I'm at I've been teaching on the power of the blood and I'm at number six um, of the power of the blood and I've been covering the sev seven places that Jesus Christ bled from where he redeemed back for us things we lost in the garden and so we're at number six, but the flagship scripture is, right, Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. And that is that we overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. And what we're looking at is now in Matthew 27, and it's uh, verse 35. And what we're looking at is what he redeemed. In the sixth place that Jesus bled from, was his feet and there he redeemed back for us was dominion and authority and it was in Matthew 27 35 that we saw this where it says he he was crucified his feet were pierced but what I want to do is I want to go back to and I've been doing this into Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and there's some things I have not covered that I think is important that I would interject at this point in time. And when God made Adam, he made him in, in, in uh, chapter Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he made him in his image and likeness. And when God made Adam in his image and likeness, he also, when he created Adam, he breathed into him nefesh. He breathed into him the soul, an eternal soul. Adam was the only creature that was created by God to look like God and to have a, an eternal soul. God then, we see in the next couple of verses, that God gave him dominion and authority over creation. Now that word dominion, a lot of times we just think it's, it's a, a very harsh or, or bad word. Basically, yes, it's not a harsh word, but basically it means... Um, to, um, to rule over, to have charge over. So Adam was given rule and charge over creation, over all the breathing things uh, that God had given to him. So he gave him a rule and authority and dominion. And Adam was to faithfully represent his father in the garden, or represent his God in the garden. And what he did, he was to care, manage, and to develop creation, which was kind of like a stewardship role, is basically what it was. He was a steward over what God had, had given him. But what Adam did, he listened to his wife. Now men, don't chuckle. He did listen to his wife, which got him into a lot of trouble. And God said, Adam, because you listened to your wife, Adam sinned with full knowledge because Adam knew that he was not to eat of the fruit of the garden. And in the day that you do that particular tree, in the day that you do, you will surely die. Adam knew that, so when his wife gave him the fruit, he ate with full knowledge. When judgment came in, God said, you listen to your wife. Basically, this is a lesson for all of us, is who are we listening to? If it isn't in the Word of God, don't listen. A lot of times we listen to other voices in our life and it gets us in trouble. Always, always align it with the Word of God. But anyways, Adam 
sin with full knowledge and dominion and authority was taken from him. So going back to the crucifix, oh, this is what I really wanted to cover at this point. Did you ever ask yourself, where is the soul? Have you ever asked yourself, where, is, where does the soul reside? And have you asked yourself, why blood? Why, why without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins? Has that ever uh, come to your mind? Well, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it explains those two, those two things, which helps us understand the crux of the need for the blood covering or the shedding of blood. And in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, For the life, that word is nefesh, which means soul, so the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your sins. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So what we see here is the soul resides in the blood. And the blood is what needs to cover sin. And in Genesis, when the law came in, when the Israelites were receiving the law from Moses, the part of the law was tooth for tooth, an eye for an eye, and a soul for a soul. So if you murdered someone and it was not an accident, you forfeited your life. So it was a soul for a soul. So an understanding here was that there has to be a blood sacrifice to cover sin. So atonement was temporary. There was atonement. So animals were sacrificed to cover blood because God could not look upon sin. God does not compromise with sin. Sin must be judged. So until redemption came along, there was the atonement and animal sacrifices. And we see in Isaiah 53, verse 10, Jesus made his soul in a... Um, uh, a sacrifice for sins. So it fulfilled the law of God, life for life, soul for soul. That's why the shedding of the blood. But as we come into Matthew 27, and Jesus' feet were pierced, dominion is in the place of the feet. So when he bled from his feet, he redeemed back for us that dominion and that authority that Adam lost in the garden. And we see this in Ephesians chapter um, 1, and I'm going to go to verse 22, but I'm sorry, verse 20. And I'm just going to take a little bit from the sentence before it so it won't be confusing. And it says, The power is the same as the mighty power he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is, that is invoked, not only in the present, but in the ages to come. Now, listen to this. This is important in verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Everything was placed under Jesus' feet. When he bled and he poured out his blood, he paid the redemption price that bought back for us our we uh, bought back for us dominion and authority. Now, as I said, dominion is in the place of the feet. Anything under our feet, we have authority and power and control over. And what we see with Jesus Christ is that when it went under his feet, he gave it to the church. He gave the authority and power back to the church. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, let's see what it says here. And it says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So what are we saying here? We are, when 
this happened, we are seated in Christ in the heavenly realms. We're here on earth, but we're also in the spirit realm, seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ, far above all principalities and powers. And we have the authority now and the dominion through the name of Jesus Christ because of what Christ did. So when Jesus bled from his feet, that dominion was transferred back to the church, which is us, and we have authority in our feet. Where do our feet take us? Probably back before we got saved, oftentimes our feet took us places we really didn't want to go, or maybe places we did want to go with the wrong motives in place. But I want to make another point uh, about this, and it's in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, and I'm going to also look at verses 17 through 20. And now this is Jesus speaking, and Jesus says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I have, now listen to this, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, don't rejoice in the fact that the demons submit to you in my name, but rejoice in the fact that you are written in the book of heaven. What Jesus did here is he gave those 72 authority and dominion to be able to do what? Trample on snakes and scorpions. That is in reference to demons. So he gives us authority now to trample on snakes, scorpions, and demons. What was Jesus doing here? Jesus was taking the kingdom of light. You know that the scripture verse where it says, how beautiful are the feet of those, how beautiful are, and lovely are the feet of those who bring good news? These people were going ahead of Christ, and they were bringing and preparing the way for the message that Jesus had. And it's much the same way for us in this day. With our feet, as we go forth, we bring the kingdom of light into darkness. We bring the good news and the message of, you know, the freedom from prison, freedom from the chains that bind us, from depression, oppression, a mental illness, all those things. We have good news. Christ came to give us life and give it abundantly, and we are carriers of that good news wherever our feet take us. And the importance is understanding is that we are taking back territory from Satan that he has taken at some point in time, and we're redeeming back what he has taken um, and bringing the good news. Let me get a little sip of water here. And I want to point out, too, that in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, God said to Joshua, wherever the sole of your foot treads, that will I give you. What God was talking about was that as Joshua was taking possession of the land for the Israelites, wherever the sole of his foot stepped, he claimed as their territory. And that's what we're doing. Our feet is claiming back territory from the kingdom of darkness. And I take that very seriously. What we do at our home, not only do we anoint the, the, the doorposts in our house with oil, that whoever walks in that door, we claim for the kingdom of God. But I also believe because the sole of our feet touch everywhere in our house, whoever walks through our door, we claim for the kingdom of God. Whoever walks in that door. We do it the same way at our church as well. We have anointed the doors out there. We claim this floor, whoever steps in here, that we claim them for the kingdom of God in the name of Christ. 
In fact, the intercessors, the one day we were having um, a prayer meeting, and it was just before harvest. We were having a harvest fest for Halloween for all of the kids out there, and we prayed over that door. We prayed over the floor. We prayed over the whole place, and my goodness, we had a hallelujah time. Uh, we just bound the enemy, took authority over the enemy, and as the kids came in, they had a great time. And it was a blessing, and we were able to minister the gospel on, and, and uh, just bless them that day. And it's just so important that wherever we go. But you know what? Psalm 91, verse 13, also says this, and it says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent, you will trample under foot. We trample the kingdom of darkness under our feet. What a scripture verse says. It says Satan goes about as a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. Yeah, I've got news for him. We trample him under our feet because he's under our dominion and our authority, and he has no right and no place taking any more territory or any more land. Another scripture verse is from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, and we are shod, our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. And what that is, is it's part of the armor. That armor, the footwear that we have for our, our armor is like the Roman footwear. The Roman footwear had spikes at the bottom of their sandals. And the reason for that was is that they could take a stand. Now that's a military term, take a stand. That they could stand, they could dig their heels in as they're fighting to push forward. And that's what we're doing when we have our feet shod with the gospel of peace. We're bringing peace, but we're not allowing the enemy to take anything that is not his. So what we do is we take a stand and we resist the devil in all that he has or tries to do. Now this scripture verse really, really um, brought home for me. And let me read this to you. And it's uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. And it says, How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless... He ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Jesus is talking about here is Satan. Satan is the strong man. And we can't take, Satan has taken for his possession what he claimed as his own. He's claimed for his own our cities, our towns, some areas of our health, maybe our children, maybe our families. Maybe even our destinies. He has no right to do that. And we need to tie the strong man up. Now we have many weapons at our disposal, but I want you to understand one thing. Satan has no weapon against the blood of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he's helpless and vulnerable at the blood of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us to know that. He tries to hide it. He lies to us, and he has no power against the blood. So when we tie up the strong man, it's many different ways that we can do this. Now, we're told that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through the pulling down of strongholds, that they are spiritual. We pull these strongholds down. We pull strongholds down through prayer, through the authority that we have. And I'm going to show you some concrete prayers that you can pray to take this authority in just a moment. We have that power of prayer. We have the power of the word. Satan uh, establishes lies and strongholds in people's minds. And when we bring the good news, we bring the word of God to them to tear those strongholds down. So we have that power and that authority. But the biggest thing with Satan to tie the strong man up, that we can go into his house and plunder his possessions is by the blood of the lamb, by drawing a bloodline or pleading the blood. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment. The power of pleading the blood and drawing a bloodline. 
we can tie up Satan, and what we can do is we can invade his household, and we can take back our children, take back our destinies, take back our health, and walk in the freedom and the abundance that Jesus Christ paid for us at that cross. The word redeem means to recover, um, recover ownership by paying a sum, an appointed sum of whatever. In this case, Jesus did not pay with silver and gold. He paid the sum with his blood. And through that, Satan has been deemed helpless and powerless. Now, let's talk about the bloodline. And the thing about the blood is the power of the blood is not so much in the fact that we have knowledge of it, it's not so much in the fact that we have an appreciation of its power. The power is in the blood, is in the area of our faith. When we have faith in the fact that the blood is all-powerful, and we speak it forth with our mouth and activate that faith and speak forth, okay? We speak it forth and we call out that bloodline over our lives. Therein is the power. Satan cannot cross the bloodline. Now, I told, you, um, in a, I told you an account of a pastor, and it was in the very first teaching that I had in the power of the blood. Um, and by the way, this is number six. I don't know if I mentioned that in the beginning. But the very first one <coughs> in the power of the blood, I told a story. Very quickly, a pastor uh, who was preaching, um, Satan threatened to kill his children with rabies if he preached that message. And he called out the bloodline on his property line because the kids were at home. He was up in Canada ministering. He called out the bloodline. He got a message from his brother. They found seven dead foxes at his uh, property line. And when they tested the foxes, they all had rabies. The foxes died at his bloodline, and that's where he called the bloodline out. He also realized something. His office back home had been broken into time after time. <coughs> time after time. And no matter how many times he involved the police, his office was broken into. His office was broken into, and he realized something. I'm going to plead the bloodline around my home. I mean, around my office. And when he did that, it stopped. I know a woman who was telling me about the fact that there were bed bugs in their office because of the clientele that they were serving. Apparently some bed bugs had gotten in and there was an infestation in the office. And she called out the bloodline around her and her desk. And when they came in to fumigate, they checked to see where the bugs were. She didn't have one, not one on her desk. The power of the bloodline. And that bloodline works in so many different ways. We can plead the blood, we can call out the bloodline. Now, every time when I wake up in the morning, this is what I do. I remind Satan of this, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. He overcame sin, death, and hell. He overcame all principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them. He poured out his blood in the heavenly of heavenlies. He was seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities and powers. All things were put under his feet. And when I was dead in sins and transgressions, and I called on him, and I believed on him to be my Lord and Savior, he quickened me, he forgave me, he sat me at, in Christ at the right hand of the Father, again, far above all principalities and powers, and above all rule and reign. And what I do is I now say to Satan, principalities, powers, in the name of Jesus Christ, I plead the bloodline between you and me. I plead the bloodline between you and my husband. I plead the bloodline between you and my children. And I call out the names of my children and my grandchildren. And I command, you will not cross the bloodline. You will not touch our health. You will not touch our finances. You will not touch us in the mental, emotional, or physical areas of our lives. As a matter of fact, you will not operate through the curse of the generations because Jesus Christ took the, cro took the cr uh, curse at the cross. He became a curse. So I curse the curse of generations to its roots. 
Furthermore, you will not interfere with my purpose and destiny or the purpose and destiny, destiny of my family members. You will not hinder the good works we have been called and ordained to do. I also call out the bloodline around our church, and I call it out from McCamley, South Park, Remolino, around and back, and I claim nothing can cross the bloodline to come into this church and harm anyone or any of us coming out of the church. I then go on to take back our cities and our towns in prayer. By the blood of the Lamb and the power, I, I, I plead that blood and I call out our city. And I command for drugs, alcoholism, overdosing, suicide, um, gang violence, domestic violence, terroristic violence, violence of any sort, you have to decease and assist and decease. Cease and desist. <laughs> Easy for you to say. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I call out that bloodline around our city. And I call for revival. And I call for our state. And I call for our nation. And what we're doing when we pray like that and we take the authority, we are binding Satan's works. We are calling him null and void. And every evil assignment he has is null and void. So... You have dominion in your feet when you are born-again believer. This is only for born-again believers. The blood has been shed, and when you receive it and believe it. Just recently, they had Victory in Europe Day, and there was a plaque that said, here is where the price of freedom was paid. When we look at the cross in the spirit realm, what we see is here is the price of freedom for us. It is through the cross and the blood that our Savior shed for us and the resurrection power that comes with us. As we start stepping out and we start, things start uh, loosening up and we start stepping out, I know that we will deal with certain things and feelings and, and we, we're not going to give in to fear with the COVID virus. We plead the bloodline around us and we command that the COVID virus cannot cross the bloodline. So as we step out, we step out in power and authority so that we can begin living our lives. And folks, this is a great time to start witnessing to people out there. A lot of things have happened, and a lot of people have been suffering through this, and we have the good news. So I pray tonight, and I close with this. May our Savior, Jesus Christ, surround you, keep you, and any of you who are struggling in your mind, may his touch upon your head just bring you an emotional and physical and a heartfelt peace as we trust and rely on him. Good night, and God bless you.